I'm going to begin as I begin uh, pretty much all my lectures. At the beginning? Yeah. In the beginning was the word? Exactly. And, and the, the word, word was lecture. And the word in this instance is, of course, spoken word, because that's what I do. Yeah, of course. I, know, I know you know this about me, but you know, non-regular listeners may not. You may or may not recognise this. I'm so happy, because today I found my friends. They're it's in, a song. They're in my head. Oh. I'm so ugly. That's oh, yes. Okay. Yes, of course. It's Nirvana. Because so you are. Did you meet that band? Oh, we'll get to that. Oh, my God. <laughs> Broke our mirrors. Sunday morning is every day for all I care, and I'm not scared. Mm. Light my candles in a day. I've just got to say, your, your, your rendition is beautiful. It's better than it. It's uh, spoken word. But there's... Okay, yes, it is spoken word. Because I found God. <laughs> what? I'll get to the next bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it goes on. So, as you recognise, it's from the Hindu prog rock band um, Nirvana. Well, let's just call them Nirvana. Yeah, okay. That's what they call themselves. It's on. It's uh, Kurt said so. Um, do you recognise the song? Mm. What's it called? Uh, I look <laughs> in, in my defence. In my defence, I put back in the day when I listened to a lot of Nirvana. It was on the CD. Now I listen to it on the on the Apple Music, um, and I would put a CD in. And that would be, I, I, I think that is track, th it's, it's number three. That's how like, I know music like, too. Yeah, it's track <laughs> four. Songs don't have names no, I agree. unless they say them over and over again in the chorus. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, I know this one. So it's the song Lithium. Oh, there you go. That's, I, uh, yes. Yeah. And so basically I'm just going to, I know you haven't heard this before. I'm just going to tell you about how, you know, when I hung out when I met Nirvana. Because <laughs> I know you've never heard that before and you love it when I do. But when I finish with that, we're going to talk about Lithium. Welcome, Welcome to The Wholesome Show. Science stories for you, if you maybe sit up the back of the class. If you're more like, um, you know, you, you like to learn, yeah. but maybe you don't want to be seen like one of those suck-ups next to the teacher. No. And if you're a suck-up and you're here, to, that's cool. That's cool. We love you too. Mm. Um, just, we, don't, we don't love you in a weird way, though. We love you in no, a respectful yeah, sure, way. Sure, sure. But experiment with being the dead shits up the back of the class who... <laughs> Like to like to crack jokes, you know, they pass messages, smoke a bong. Exactly. Those people up the back of the class, this is the podcast of science for you. And we ask the questions that those people would ask so that all you who sit up the front don't have to. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant. And me, uh, Dr. Roderick Griffin. I met Nirvana and you didn't. Lambert. <laughs> <laughs> and is brought to you by the Australian National. Centre for the Public Awareness of 90s Grunge and Science. And Science. In that order, at least when I'm around. <laughs> I, I, do, I, I do hope that somewhere there is a, a government-funded centre uh, <laughs> whose job it is to make people aware of 90s Grunge. It could be us. It's chock full of um, uh, what are, Gen Xers sitting around just, just wishing times, you know, saying how much music attained perfection yeah. in 1991. I cannot get shorts that are quite long enough, <laughs> and these flannies are too stiff. <laughs> it's not easy. It's not easy being You us. can still buy Doc Martens, though. They weren't a big 90s thing. What? That they were pre. in my world. That Obviously, was pre. No, Far North Queensland, big on the Doc Martens. Okay, we were slow to get things. Did you, did you have one pair that you all shared? <laughs> yeah, we did. It's come it, from the south. It was, it was like the one jumper that we all shared. <laughs> At once? <laughs> no, like if anyone was going down south, you'd, you'd, you'd borrow the jumper. Oh, it's, you know, Keith's going south again. <laughs> He's got the fuzzy. So look, uh, never, no, lithium. Let's talk about lithium. Lithium, yeah, tell me about it. Because who doesn't love a metal? It's a metal? It's the lightest metal of the periodic I period. knew it was light because hydrogen, helium, lithium. It's, yes. it's, it's like yes. atomic element number three. I got them memorised all the way up to three. So Damn. You don't, <laughs> so I was very lucky. Have a stab at four. I, I, brilliant. No, it's wholesomonium. <laughs> we can't just claim it. Wholesome Stein. No. 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 Uh, yeah, I was lucky. So you did know number four. I, We're yeah. just making it up. Yeah, don't test me to go too far. I, I could. You could tell me whatever you want. I would have no Boron. idea. Boron is next. Such a fucking dog. <laughs> I'm the one who sat at the back of the class and I saved him. I rescued him from himself. No, maybe I was just reading periodic tables up the back of my other class. Like I was just, yeah. yeah. In English lit, because they're wankers. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, atomic number three, lightest of the solid elements. So, so, so it's not a gas, it's just light. It's light metal. Yeah. And so naturally the word lithium comes like from a, the word for stone. That's you, why you do it. Oh, does it? Yeah, yeah, lith yeah, yeah. lithos, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And you can see why. Uh, no, not really. No. But you'll tell me no. in a second. But you can you can make like a tin out of it. You can make a metal object out of it. Out of pure lithium? Yeah. It would have a tendency to burst into red flame if it came to, <laughs> if it was pure and got anywhere near heat and stuff. Okay, all right. It's so, a little reactive. So in a vacuum you could do this. Yeah, or you just mix it with shit. Um, but it's it's basically found naturally in anything, like rocks, soil, bodies of water, there's um or still bodies of water. So it's around. Okay. Yeah. It's but it's only point there we go, point zero zero zero. Let me guess, wait. Percent. Oh no, I was gonna guess. You're gonna say seven? I was gonna I was gonna say yeah. seven. Yeah. That's one squintillionth of a percent, seven squintillionth of a percent. Of the so there's some lithium crust. in this room right now, right? But uh, oh, but not much. It. Um, it's got that that metallic tang. Yeah, it's that. I meant Nirvana taste. You could. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's soft, silvery white. As I said, it's highly reactive, flammable. Flares into a bright crimson, so it's pretty. It's good mm. in fireworks and stuff. Okay. But you've got to store it in a mineral oil, otherwise it goes poof. So you can have a tin, but you'd have to have a your tin. Yeah, some mineral oil around the tin. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. standard tin or a rucksack. Yeah, so you put the tin in like a Tupperware container yep. with mineral oil. Yep. And so, yeah, you can put yeah. your baked beans in there, but it's yep. not that useful. That's how you do it. That's how I've always, that's how I carry baked beans <laughs> when I'm carrying them with me. <laughs> um, yeah, it's self-heating. So you just you just take the tin out, lithium explodes, then you've got your cooked baked that's beans. That's true, and it's pretty to watch while they cook. Apparently, along with hydri- hydrium, I was going to say, hydrogen, helium. Um, that one is number one and two. One and just two. If, if, if anyone's doing the count here. What's number seven? Hydrogen, helium, hydrogen, helium. 30 days has November, April, June, and November. Einstein, uh, It starts with N. Nitrogen. Neon. Neon. It's neon. There you go. I don't know. I lasted chemistry in 1982. Oh, me too, and I fell asleep. Like I, I, I don't try and cool now. My ke- no, don't <laughs> try and cool now. I, my chemistry class is slip through. That's why you remember the first 900 <laughs> elements. I got to four. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> apparently, hydrogen, helium, and lithium are the only elements created at the birth of the universe. Yeah. I know. But apparently, this is according to some sources. Well, not really. How can that? I mean, soon after. At. No, soon after. At. No. How, how I've read my Birth of the Universe stories. How are we carving up time? Oh, here? look, what, time is bendy at this point. Yeah. Time is bendy. Hasn't really started yet, but yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm going to say soon after. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Egghead. Um, but according to the Big Bang Theory, or however you want to word it, the universe should hold three times as much lithium as can be accounted for, at least in the older stars. So there's missing lithium? Yeah, there's missing lithium. Oh. It okay. seems. Dark lithium. Yeah. Yeah, secret, secret lithium. Um, probably the hell, Hillsong or something. Anyway, so the Brazilian naturalist and statesman, and I, I know you you know the name, but I'll tell others. Yeah, cool, cool. Jose Bonifacio de Andralde e Silva. You know, you know, Jose. Yeah. He discovered a mineral called... Is that Lula? Lula. De Silva. De Silva. Uh, eh, 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 Silva. Okay. He's not... De, he's Give me a look at his name. Give me a look at his name. Uh, no, no, it's different. Mm. Eh. You're thinking De Silva, the guy who invented cats. I'm not. <laughs> anyway, cats. Cats. anyway, that guy, that guy, the, the statesman and naturalist E. Silva. Yeah, statesman and naturalist from Brazil. He um, discovered the mineral petalite uh-huh. or patilite. I assume it's petalite. Yeah. But patilite sounds far more exotic. Other than the patilite with the, with the piquant source. Uh, that's actually lithium, alloy, siliconio, oxygen, something. It's long. Uh, it's a lot in it. It's a, a, more, a more chemistry thing. So yeah, some sort yeah. of mineral. Yeah. And he found it on a Swedish island in the 1790s, the island of Utu. Utu. That's how it's U-T. Uh. Well, for starters, I don't know my Brazilian history that well. But uh, Yeah, yeah, come on. No, Give I don't. I don't. I didn't know how much uh, people were claiming to be Brazilian in 1790. Um, on a Swedish island? Okay, cool. Swedes didn't mind. Yeah, fair enough. They were busy being cool. I, I like the I like the reverse colonialism there that uh, yeah. someone from the colonies has gone and mined mined Europe at that point. Yeah, they backed that shit up uh, in eighteen seventeen. So a little bit later, Swedish chemist Johan August Afwedsen, yes, or is it Afwedsen? Uh, he discovered that patilite or petalite contained a previously unknown element. Oh, did he? But he couldn't quite isolate it perfectly. He only got one of the salts out: lithium by triple salt. Yeah, salty lithium. Salty lithium. And according to what I could find, it was it's either more first, of your table lithium. I oh know it's more your table lithium. Yes, exactly. It's uh, it's not your fancy lithium that you would put in a your exploding light, lithium, or the one yeah. you put in a light to give you good vibes when you sleep, like oh. your Himalayan salts. Uh, is that in there too? No. 
So uh, you got to keep it at least a little bit factual, <laughs> a little bit factual for the listeners. There's they need some sort of facts thread through here, and they're there are going to be so many facts. They're saying thank you, Will. Just put him on a fact train here. So many delicious facts. Well, then you went like this. So it was first isolated, and best I could tell, either in 1821 or 1855. So <laughs> one or the other. You know what that is. You know what that is. Yeah. Is 1821. They did it. 1855. They did it as well, but they did the lit review after they did the did yeah, the work, yeah. and they're oh fuck, God. Whoopsie. Oh, we'll just, just claim it. Don't tell your supervisor. Don't tell your supervisor. Well, one of them just was, say you did the lit one review. One of them was Robert Bunsen. One of them was Robert Bunsen, the chemist, and he's more famous. Inventor of the burner. Yeah. No. Yeah. He invented of the Robert. <laughs> so they electrolysisized lithium chloride to separate it out. Okay. So we flash forward 1923 in Germany. They started commercially producing lithium to do what commercial stuff um for example so <laughs> get your lithium get your lithium yeah do you want what some you lithium? Do I, 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 don't I, I don't know it's great it's i oh, know we'll get to that we'll get to why you'd bother uh the first fully man-made nuclear reaction was was based on lithium transmutation of lithium atoms into helium in 1932 oh, really hmm. there you go and also into lithium if, if, uh, uh, you know I'm, I'm i you know nuclear fission this we're talking here where you're splitting, splitting. Oh, no, we're up your alley right now we're not yeah, i know yeah, i, know, I, know, I, I just know, got yeah. just, just got to say that you know they're splitting lithium to get to helium yep. um probably a helium or hydrogen or something like that cool it's awesome uh, what i mean probably you know i just think wouldn't it be easier to start with a big atom like a big fat chunky atom no if, but there's if, more mess <laughs> leftovers <laughs> that's true that's true but what do we do but, with these but you, i feel like your your your, your atom splitting knife has yeah. to be a lot sharper to cut through these tiny little lithium atoms well i wonder you know, a big fat a big fat uranium atom are they splitting or are they fusing now fusing fusing we, we, fusion. we hardly do that uh, fusion fusion's the one that's coming in 50 years time yeah well we're doing yeah. a little bit of it now we yeah, can't we can you know fusion fusion you normally fuse together two tiny tiny atoms um uh Two types of uh, isotopes of hydrogen. So they're tiny and you fuse them together Bang and get some helium. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Gives yeah. you energy. Fission, we normally split uranium, which is a big fat atom. Yeah. Big fat. Atomic atom. number of 8,000, isn't it? 9,000. Uh, no, 284. No, that's 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 the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, and it's two two three eight. I don't know anything about that. Uh, I don't know how many protons it's got. It's a proton might be is a Chrysler, 70, isn't it? 70 or 80? Uh, <laughs> 200 Chryslers in one little... The lumpy period. bits inside the middle of an atom. Yeah. It doesn't have a middle. It's a cloud. You've been lied to. That model's wrong. The <laughs> orbiting model is wrong. So, you also can use lithium deuteride, which comes from this uh, transportation, uh, in um, fuel for staging thermonuclear weapons. But they didn't do that back in the 1920s. No, they were good people. Like when they were 1930s. selling it in Germany. We're in the 1930s now. Oh, okay, I know there were people in the 1930s in Germany who'd be interested in, um, in probably, nuclear weapons. Yes. Uh, they didn't get as far as they hoped. Which is probably good. I th well, it depends. I mean, I, mean uh, I don't mean to be Nazi racist. But History is written by the winners, but I know that we would talk about certain incidents that we're very used to talking about as yeah. pretty much as evil as you can get, probably in a different way. That's which, true. Which wouldn't be great. If half the earth had been irradiated by 1930s yeah. humans. Yeah. Yeah. That would be an issue. Um, the first major application of lithium was in high-temperature lithium greases. Well, of course, you in got lithium any, grease. Got any lithium <laughs> grease? High-temperature lithium. I need some li Is this for cooking your sausages yes. super quick? And and lubricating aircraft engines and shit in World War II. Okay. Um, during the Cold War, the demand for lithium dramatically increased because, you know, nuclear fusion and stuff. Uh, weapons that bang with stuff together. Both lithium-6 and lithium-7 produce tritium. When they're irradiated by the neutrons, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are handy for making lithium so deuteride. What's, tr what's tritium? That's three yums. Isotope of hydrogen. I thought it was water. You can you can have heavy that, heavy water yeah. has tri has uh, the H two O. H three O. Um, actual chemists in here don't don't rely on me for your chemistry knowledge. I feel like I might have one percent more chemistry knowledge than that guy, so I'm just oh, I'm, I'm just you've helping. Got twenty percent more than me. At All least. right, so we'll take two, But but actual chemists are like, fuck this guy, he's a dickhead. Um, yeah, they're yelling at their their iPod right now, like, <laughs> shut up, you fucking wrong idiot. Uh, you can, you can have heavy water, which supposedly is delicious. Um, no, you can taste the difference. Of or you or can. So, some people can tell. That's the only way I have my martinis. <laughs> heavy water only, please. Actually, no, scotch and heavy water. Thank you, scotch and. I don't know if it's water. actually heavier, um, but that's the the heavy water is. Oh, it's heavier. Is what they use in nuclear fusion. Yeah, so lithium is good for that. Oh, um, well. The US became the prime producer of lithium in the late fifties, cool. uh, up into the mid eighties, and then once. Lithium so they're not just getting it from the Swedish island still. Yeah, that's, there's not much of it left. It's been, <laughs> Dug uh, one island down. It's like the the, uh, the island that was for the, um, the bat guano. Uh, yeah, the poo-poo island. The poo-poo island. For sunscreen and, 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 yeah, and delicious 
I don't know, treats? Phosphate. Phos- uh, that's right, um, yeah. Fertilizers. Phosphate and bombs. Phosphate. Yes. So lithium ion batteries increased demand for lithium quite a lot in ah, the they do too, early yeah. 2000s. So lithium ion became very popular. You've probably heard of it. I have. I have. I've, I've got a battery that is lithium ion. Do you? Yeah. Do you keep it in a cabinet so that no thieves can steal it? I keep it inside my things. Thing. He keeps it in his things. Apparently nowadays, Chile and Australia produce the most lithium cool. in the world. I, 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 I feel a bit proud of that, but not really. Just a bit proud. A gentle Australian pride. But I don't want to talk about any of that. I want to talk about lithium and health. Thank fuck. Lithium, lithium and health. health. So many people have thought of, you know, the, they believe in the curative properties of, of metals. Uh, mineral waters. Metals. Yeah, yeah. Eat some metal. Yeah. You need more iron in your diet. I don't mean like eat a car. Well, there's that French guy that did. He, uh, he, uh, bicy- oh, he ate a car, didn't he? And a plane. A, he got to a plane? He got to a plane. Like in shavings in his I, I I got to tell you, listener, I looked up this guy to do a Wholesome Show episode Gross. on it. And then I got to the end, I was like, there's no story except the sad guy that spent his life eating eating metal. And bombed um, engine parts for the rest of his days. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, oh. and oh, like he did it for entertainment. And he probably had an okay life. I don't think he died of it, um, but... Uh, this is, this, is, this is a very broad definition of entertainment. <laughs> I'm bored. I'll eat a plane. I'm, I'm bored. I'll watch someone eat a plane. Like that, I am. See, that, that makes sense because it's on television. No, it's no. on a screen. It, it took him two years to eat the plane. So it wasn't, it wasn't like he sat down like Cookie Monster and crunched through the <laughs> oh, plane nom, 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 nom. in like four seconds. Me, I mean, get, that, me eat passenger. That I would really watch. I would cookie really. Cookie Monster eat a plane? Yes. Watch yes, Cookie I, Monster I would really, anything. really watch that. Um, <laughs> it's one of those pofagi, um, um, offagi, offagi, plain apophagy. No, like um, uh, you know the whole, whole series of disorders where people eat things um, that they shouldn't. Unexpected uh, rocks or ice or yeah. metal. Yeah, buildings. Yep. Um, well, yeah, so it became not a story. It became a sad thing, and so I didn't do it. There you go. But well, so that's the, that's one of the stories I'm not doing today. Yeah. Um, so mineral waters have been something that people are into for years, for, for mm. millennia. Are they actually? I mean, I know I, I thought it meant like of like from a mineral spring or something. Yeah, like a miny water. Yeah, from mines. Oh yeah, things what bubble up. Yeah, and so they've been a lot of them would have naturally occurring lithium salts in the groundwater, and so it would congeal in these mineral springs. Okay. So the ancient Greeks, Romans, Native Americans would bathe in mineral waters, and they would attribute healing properties to the mineral springs, which yeah. likely contain lithium as well. Health spas. Yeah, man. I only go there for the chess. Like the Russians where you stand up to your your, your boobs in a pool with a floating chest. No board. Russian man has boobs. No Russian man has boobs. <laughs> no Russian man doesn't, except for, <laughs> except for the, what's his name, not Yeltsin. Vladimir. The other shit. Vladimir. Putin? Is it yeah, Putin? that's him. Golf man? <laughs> Um, Soranus of Ephesus was a medical doctor from the second century. He prescribed mineral waters for people who were manic and had other psychiatric problems, but also for shitloads of other things. <laughs> yeah. So stuff. But, but like, like all doctors <laughs> of the second century, they had one, one remedy and they said, use that for everything. Use this. Yeah. yeah take leeches. It, yeah. You nearly sprained your fingers <clears> doing <throat> those air quotes. That was a big one. Doctors out. So in the late 19th and into the early 20th century, lithium was basically seen as a cure-all. And it was so they knew it was lithium that was um, in the health spa water? It, or else it was, I mean, one article I read ca- called it the turmeric of the late 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you're listening to this well into the future, turmeric is uh, quite popular in health, health conscious circles. Do they bathe in it though? No, this is drinking it now. This is consuming okay. it. So they'd add it to pretty much everything. So it was, it was common for companies, of course, to bottle spring water, etc. But my favourite was lithium citrate. Which in, your, is, in your lemon juice? Oh, kind of. It's in an indigestible salt form. It was in the original 7-Up recipe. Oh, really? <laughs> I love, I love <laughs> that the soft drinks we have now all came from these ultra-wacky pasts. Yeah, cocaine, like, lithium, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, This one's got heroin and live <laughs> pigs in it. You know, it's great. Swallow a live pig with your bubbles. I also love, it was originally called, when it was first marketed, 7-Up seven seven up was called Bib Label Lithiated Lime and Lime Soda. Yeah, I get why they changed that. Imagine I, the ad. you got the woman in the bikini as they used to have a seven up ads. <laughs> Come and get your bib label, lithiated lemon lime soda. Bib label. Bib label. Bib label. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I just don't know. Do you think it was a long committee meeting where they decided to change? Or, or the, really or the, new, or the new name? I've got a name. Done. <laughs> well, each one says one, two, three, four, four. 
they knew they were going to call it soda, and then five people got to add a word. <laughs> um, that was launched in 29, 1929. So Seven Up stop adding lithium citrate. They liked the lots formula. of words back then, though. Like they it's really like the, it's did. like the book titles yeah. that go for a page, half the book, and yeah. yeah so, yeah. but just for marketing, okay, we, we've got something we want to sell. It's called Bib Label Lithiated Lemon Lime Soda, and you can see the marketing people going, "Ah, oh, fuck, <clears throat> this again." Couldn't we just call it something else? So Seven Up, but in that was in 1929. In 1948, they stopped adding the lithium citrate. So it was it, until then anyway. It was thought of as a health drink. Any reason? Yeah, they didn't want to put it in anymore. It cost too much. Yeah, fair enough. It, it probably did, and also it didn't matter. Like people were probably buying it anyway. So more specifically, though, and you would have most likely heard of this, uh, lithium was and has and still is used for mental illness, particularly yes, I bi- do. bipolar conditions. and Hence Nirvana, because I think Nirvana. I think Kurt Cobain a suffered from the mental Ill, Ill issues. He was a little bit on the not undepressed side of things. I've heard, I've yeah. heard, yeah. So particularly for bipolar conditions and... How'd that work out for him? Fine, He's, he doesn't have it anymore. Did I tell you I'd met him? Keep going, keep going. <laughs> Now, I confess, a chunk of the stuff I'm going to tell you about comes from uh, a piece in news.com. I'm not proud. But it was a review of a book by someone who actually has a brain. So this is not all that, that only comes from there. But so lithium as a, as a cure, at least as a treatment for particular, de- you know, particular depression and bipolar, or what used to be known as manic depression, is still a thing. But where did it begin? Mm. So finally, the real story begins. <coughs> you going to choke? So it begins in 1912 in country Victoria, Really? Australia. Are you serious? Yeah. I thought it was Franny Fisher's murder mysteries and not much else in country yeah, Victoria in 1912. Yeah, no, no. But you thought it was going to be a Swedish island with Spaniards. I did, I did. For guano. Or at least the Germans, who were very happy to experiment with things in the 1920s. I thought, yeah. They, were, they weren't the only ones, though, to be fair. So, Doctor, yeah. well, he wasn't a doctor then. John Cade was born uh, in 1912. His father was a GP. And when he was little, his father buggered off to World War One, served in Gallipoli and in France. So he got he got the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, when he came back, he was suffering oh. from what they were calling war weariness. You're a bit tired, mate. That's what it is. How was the war? Fuck, you, I'm now. You probably didn't have enough sleep during yeah, the war. Yeah. Maybe if you have a bit more have sleep now, yeah. then you'll be fine. How much would you like? I'd like infinity, please. Oh. Um, no, he didn't kill himself. Um, but he had difficulty continuing his GP practice. So he, he ended up working... <sighs> I was just, just thinking about the, the oh. ways that they didn't oh. treat didn't treat PTSD uh, yeah. after after that war. Yeah. And it's not like they're better after and more recent since, wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. But at least they acknowledge it and know. Um, I know that we're still dealing with a lot of not dealing with that after Afghanistan and things like we that. We are dealing with a, not, a lot of not dealing with that. Um, so his father sold his practice and he, he got a job with the mental hygiene department. <laughs> I love that. That's a great name. You're mentally dishygienic. God, it's great. Could we petition like the Australian Psychological Association to change their name it's back the to mental hygiene? mental hygiene? I think Department of Health should be called <coughs> mental hygiene, or at least it should be half called that. Well, yeah, the, the mental bits, obviously. You're so picky. Um, so over the next 25 years, he became the doctor, the, the dad, Cade Senior, became a medical superintendent at a bunch of Victorian mental hospitals. Okay. So he got over his war weariness enough, oh, totally at kidding. least enough that he can he can have a job. And he'll help other people. And his family, would they'd live on campus as such. They'd live on the campuses of the hospitals. Which campus? All of them. The campuses of the No, I'm just thinking of, uh, I, I have been to um, some old mental hospitals in country Victoria, and I, was, I, I checked them out one time, so. Well, we're going to mention one. In <coughs> Which one? I'm not going to tell you. Oh, well, it's that one. It's that yeah. one. I know it. I know it it's intimately. A, it's the one I lived in. <laughs> I was dared to stay overnight in the screamer's wing. <laughs> um, so as a young boy, uh, John Cade would go from asylum to asylum, as, as this is how it was. Right. That's a cool upbringing. It's so do? cool. No, and apparently so he, he would see mentally ill patients every day of his life, at least as a child, says um, a psychiatrist who is an author of a, a book about him, if you want to know what it and, is. And, and I know that they did vary enormously, like those sorts of yeah. institutions. You yeah, could have, you could have a, 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 a good, uh, benevolent, well-meaning director, um, or you could have other. You could uh, also have a good and benevolent, well-meaning director who did terrible things because yeah, they no doubt. thought they no were doubt. doing the right thing. But remember, this is like pre-1940s. This is not a great time to be mentally ill. There never is a good one, but that would have been worse. So, um, yeah, according to the psychiatrist guy called Greg Demore, who wrote a, um, a book about John Cade, Lithium, etc., um, and he said, look, basically to Cade as a child, instead of being objects of curiosity or people to fear, the mentally ill that he saw, he regarded them as friends. He became used to them and they, oh, yeah. cool. they were people. That's nice. Which is cool, yeah. That's why he was actually Certainly, normalized. Yeah, not the not the common attitude of the time. 
So that's quite positive. Um, so he studied med, uh, medicine at med, uh, University of Melbourne. He became a house officer at St. Vincent's Hospital. I assume that means resident doctor. Then he went to the Royal, Royal, Royal Children's Hospital. And then he became severely ill with bilateral pneumococcal pneumonia. That's a lot of pneus. Pneumococcal pneumonia. And while he was... Both lungs. Lessing, so yes. bilateral. Yeah. Yeah. All three lungs. The third one. The middle one's the one you preserve. <laughs> the, hidden, the hidden lung. Yeah. Yeah. Your, your secret yeah. extra lung. Yeah. We all have one. Um, while he was convalescing, he uh, fell in love with one of the nurses called Jean. And in 1937, they got married. But this is very much a 1930s story. Isn't it? You're convalescing in a hospital, you fall in love with the nurse. Yeah. That's just yeah. what you do. It's the English patient. Did, did they tell nurses about putting up boundaries back then? No, no, they told them not to have them. <laughs> no boundaries, nurses. Just... Now remember, this is where you put the thermometer, and if any patient wants to marry you, you say yes. <laughs> like, like every story. Yeah. Every story and bring them a sandwich. So they fell in love, loved each other, married in 1937. He became a captain in the Australian Army Medical Corps, or the AIF, what is it, Australian Infirm Forces? Infantry Forces? Infantry. Idiot Forces? I doubt it. Anyway, July 1940, he um, was posted to the uh, a field ambulance unit, and he was trained as a psychiatrist, but he served as a surgeon and wandered off to Singapore in 1941. Uh-huh. So that went well. He was captured. Oh. And a prisoner of war in Changi for three and a half years. That's horrible. Yeah, I gather yeah, it of, wasn't good. Of uh, many, many prisoners of war suffered yeah. suffered a lot during that war. Um, Changi wasn't great. For the, basically the Australian suffering centre zone, I think. Yeah. yeah. If you don't like the airport, <coughs> you should have seen the prison camp. I don't, think I don't think they're in the same place. Same name, must be the same place. <laughs> yeah, exactly, same name, yes. But First time I went there, we're going to land at Changi. He's like, oh, I, don't, I don't want to. I just don't want to. So anyway, um, he, was psych- he was the only psychiatrist in that area and they set up a little uh, kind of medical thing, the Australians and the British, within within the um, prison camp, mm-hmm. which is a surprise. So he started up a mental health unit. And until now, basically, the standard wisdom was serious mental illness was because you had a poor upbringing or bad morals, etc. It was the 40s. Yeah. Right. On average, that was, the, that was the position. So Kate started observing patients and, and folk. I suppose really everyone in Changi was a patient in some way. Um and they had similar symptoms to the ones he'd treated and seen before the war. And he started thinking, wait, I think there's something else going on here. And what he observed, according to his biographer, was that serious mental illness could be caused by biological changes, like changes in the chemistry or the okay. structure of the brain. Not just bad upbringing. Yeah, or, or wicked morals, yeah. believing in the wrong God or the wrong version of the same God. But instead it can be something chemical. Yeah. Okay. They didn't think that before? Not they often. They didn't think that before? I mean, look, I think this is, this is fairly broad. <coughs> and to be fair, the biographies that we're talking about this guy – written by Australians, really were very, this guy's an Australian god. So I think there might have been yeah, okay. a little liberty. The, the word hagiography did come up okay, occasionally. Fair enough, so, fair enough. Uh, for those who don't know what that is, um, we will we'll, we'll tell you uh, in the show no, notes. I'm not going to tell you. Anyway, so he, was, he may have been a little bit overly lauded. But so that's what it seems. On the whole, that wasn't, un, that wasn't common to think of mental illness as being anything other than, you know, dirty, naughty things. So he would do autopsies on the patients of people who died and had problems and he'd find physical causes like blood this clots. This is while he's still in Changi? Yeah, still in yep. Changi. So he'd find blood clots and stuff in the brain and kind of go, okay, this one was particularly messed up and they behaved weirdly and they got blood clots. Uh, okay. This is yeah. organic. This is biological. And he started thinking that illnesses like schizophrenia and manic depression might actually have organic or physical causes. That's an amazing thing to think. I mean, like, yeah. like this shift in thinking. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I get that we are very much okay with that kind of thing now. Like, like Ooh. that there's some sort of chemistry going on, and you, your chemistry can be unbalanced. Mm. Ah. Yeah. So he went, hmm, hang on, and so as as it's been put, this idea took root and it incubated while he was still not back in Australia. He didn't publish any journal articles while he was in Changi. Yeah, yeah, the Changi Journal. I, I would have thought you should, three and a half years, you'd get a couple out. Yeah, I would have thought, lazy, not a real academic, oh. not going anywhere. So in 1946, as he, he came back to Australia and it was as it was put, he was on a mission. And later in life, he wrote about this time, I returned from three and a half years as a POW of the Japanese, mourning the wasted years and determined to pursue the ideas that had germinated in that See, I, I time. have not been in a prison camp. But uh, you I visited a few. I, see, I, no, no. Well, no, not really. I, I, all, all I'm thinking. Okay, yes, yes. There would be things I'd want to do when I come back, but mostly I'd be thinking. You know what? I, I want. I, I'm thinking of that delicious meal, yeah. and I'm thinking not of being beaten. Uh, yeah, that one. Yes. Uh, not wondering if I was going to having every having an day. awesome shower would be nice. Oh God. Um, maybe when I'm feeling physically well again, making the sweet, sweet love. But uh, oh. uh, you know, I'm. I'm I, I get oh. career aspirations are coming are coming back, but I'm not sitting there going, no. you know what, you know what, I want to... Uh, Dude on a mission. Yeah, fair. This, good this, on him. This guy was into it. 
So, um, I mean, maybe maybe you'd sit there and you think, you know, when I come back, get a new podcast. That's it. That's it. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll start. Wanna, po- I'll start yeah, my podcast. I'm worried about the mentally ill. Not. I really want to eat and bang. <laughs> oh, and have a shower eventually. It's true though. I get off any plane, all I think about is having a shower. Oh, I love showers. Oh, let's have one now. Put pause. <laughs> I feel dirty. <laughs> So at the time, you'd be amazed to hear, 1946, there weren't really any effective treatments for people with severe depression or bipolar conditions. Amazing, right? Mm, I am amazed. Who would have thought? Um, So basically going into an asylum was the only option, um, which wasn't cool. And the biographer who writing about Cade said, look, the the patients would often remain frozen and weird and locked up in their depressive states for quite a while until the symptoms maybe thawed or they returned to normalcy. It's just... Put them there and see. Let's see what I happens. Mean, what's the worst yeah. going to happen? We'll, you know, lock them up for a while. Yeah. They're protected, yeah. and then maybe they'll just get better yeah. on their own. Yeah. And if they survive the the year, for some reason the year seemed uh, critical here. It, it, yeah, this, it was after a year they imagined they'd get better, and that it was he added the addendum if if they survived that year. If if so, so it wouldn't go well. Oh, did they have an attrition rate that was above zero per year? It was above zero. That's it not was great. more than none. That's how they measured. How'd you go? Well, more than none. No longer alive. Look, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what their practice. Were. I mean, obviously there would be some barbarism, but you know, are they doing things like suicide watch and stuff like that? Look, I assume not, but there's certainly suicide would have been a big part of it. Maybe not only though. Um, maybe people just stopped eating. Maybe they. Yeah, I don't know. I could speculate forever, yeah. but I shan't. Um, so Cade thought that mania was caused by an excess of a naturally occurring substance in the body. He wasn't sure what it was. It's maniacum. Yeah, man- maniacanismus. And depression was caused by having a deficiency of the substance. Oh, not enough antidepressma. Dysmaniacal. Um. You don't have enough maniacals. <laughs> Antidepressma. I have the antidepressants. No, you have multiple depressmas. Abunditude. No, but it's an absence of something. So it's got to be... You, you, oh, yeah. yeah. An so absence it's of it's antidepressma. the absence of, ma- of mania. The double zero. You have the happy a- atom and yes. the unhappy atom. Or, or not enough happy atoms. This is you're very good at chemistry. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, ha- ha- happy atom has a couple of isotopes. So. But isn't there an argument once you start talking at the atom level, whether it's physics or chemistry, and then, well, man, those conferences get ugly. At the boundary. Oh, they fight over it. The they physicists over and chemists, they Who owns it? They fucking hate each other. Luckily, no physicists listen to this, do they, Tim? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, so after the war broke out, he worked at the Bandura Repatriation Mental Hospital near Melbourne. Yeah. Did you visit that one? Bandura. Uh, I'll say yes. I thought you it was might. great. It's got haha walls. Does it really? I love a haha wall. It's uh, no the uh, wall where you sort of um, dig a ditch mm. and put the wall down in the ditch so that when you're sitting on the the lawn above uh, above the wall, like inside the, but you can't see the wall when you're sitting inside. Whoa. So so, but you still can't get outside of the wall. So a moat. It's not quite a moat. I mean, it's 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 like the the mental asylum still has a wall around it, but the wall is lowered down so that you can't climb over it, but you can't see it. It's nice. But if it's a low wall, I feel like I could get over a. No, you wall. can't because there's a ditch. There's a ditch in front of it. Like like the the height from the bottom of the ditch to the top of the wall is still like three meters. Can't so climb the, over the that ditch. Would it be like a moat? <laughs> no, it wouldn't. They'd have drainage. There's drainage. There's no crocodiles. Oh, there. I love drainage. No, and and so yeah, so the ditch is not like you can just jump over the wall. So it's a it's a no because you land in the moat. But if you're sitting in your lawn chair on the lawn, right? You look out. You don't see a wall. Ah, oh. which is nice. You could do that with prisons now. So you'd be freely caged. You could yeah, freely. You you have the 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 illusion, the, the illusion that you are not not walled in, I which would be nice. With no barbed wire in it. I don't know if it was nice. that one. I don't know if it's no. That I, don't, one. I don't know if they had that here. I, I doubt it. So I don't, I don't know why they're called ha ha walls because ha ha walls because it sounds to me like you've it's got cheaper. this you've got this nice concept of you know what let's let's we need to have walls for their safety and others yeah. but let's make them invisible walls um, yeah. but saying ha ha is like ah oh, tricked you now there is a wall not a real wall sucker idiot sucker you idiot not only mentally ill you stupid I mean I don't think that's cool so um he worked there um and there, there was with the ex soldiers who were incarcerated with their mental illness i love the word incarcerated uh, but they were they were locked yeah. up for, with their mental illness stuff but of course at the time there were no imaging devices to look at the structure and size of the brain when talking 1946 mm-hmm. doing a bunch of blood tests was pretty intrusive and gross but also they didn't really know what to look for yeah so he had to find a way to look for this hypothesized substance Man- maniacum yeah, maniacal. This, this is us guessing that. That's not yeah, no, it's not the official name, but it will be. They'll change it. We'll, we'll, we'll write a paper. No, we won't. No, we won't. Um, so the solution is pretty obvious. Obviously, he turned to... Uh, magic? Urine. Well, <laughs> of course, of course. It's me. <laughs> he turned to piddle. 
I didn't what, know this. What can we this. get out of people easily? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and they even, no matter how sick you are, you tend to do the wee wees. Mm. So Cade reckoned that if mania was due to an excess of a chemical circulating in the body, then maybe some excess of that would be piddled out and he could measure it. Well, wouldn't that be the problem though? If you're weeing out too much of it? You whittle out yeah, too okay. much to un, un manium. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. So um, he thought, well, I can get the wee wees and I can measure it and see what it might be. So his wife, Jean, says, um, she remembers the start of his husband's experiments. He came to me and he said, I've got to do some research on why these patients Gladys, have got... Gladys, Gladys, Jean, 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 can I... Uh, I've got an idea. I, can I borrow something of yours? Uh, oh, he didn't want her wee wee. He's not I a freak. He? He's not a freak. Not. Doesn't he want some... She's so not incarcerated. Surely, but surely she's ecstatic and so you need, you need um, some happy people <laughs> to compare with the, some happy the people. depressed. Yeah, happy so people to compare exactly, to Exactly, exactly. You walk around the street and you say, look, how happy are you today, sir? Can I borrow your wee? Can I? I'll give it back. You're a control group. So, no, he didn't do that because um, he was just comparing different levels of manic people in, okay. the, in the asylum. So, yeah, he, she says, he, he came to me and he said, I've got, some, I've got to do some research on why these patients have got different illnesses. I'd like to find the melancholias first, depression and other illnesses, as they were referred to, the melancholias. I've got an idea that might come to something if I save a lot of jars. <laughs> we need, we'll be eating the prune jars. Come yeah, on. We need a lot of jars. And, and she said at first she didn't know why he needed them. So anyway, he started accumulating jars. Like he'd travel to Melbourne and buy buttloads of bulky glass jars. <laughs> like buttloads apparently. He'd start to put them in the house, then in the garage, and it just started. These are, these are empty, jars. empty jars. Empty, empty they're, jars. They're empty at the moment. All right, he's getting, that's ready. Okay. He's getting his kit together. <laughs> his wife, Jean, wasn't particularly stoked, and she would First say to him, we don't jars. have any money, dude. And I kept telling him, we don't have any money. Why are you buying these jars? His reply was, we might be able to use them afterwards for pickles. No, no, no. Why no, wait till afterwards? I, look. Um, <laughs> there are preservative effects. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be. Yeah, no. You want a wee pickle? Oh, just. <laughs> So apparently, as soon as they had enough jars, or he had enough jars, fuck knows how many. Why enough were people so much more happy with wee wee? Yeah, like they seem to be whatever. You know, you just give it a, a quick wipe out, and then you're done. Back then, I don't know. I don't know. There is nothing here that doesn't say she would have. Like, the, okay, to be fair, I found nothing when they said I reused them. Okay, he didn't. He just thought about it. But as will become apparent, he collected a lot of urine. <laughs> <laughs> so as soon as he had enough jars, which is. N jars, mm-hmm. he started to fill them with urine he got from his patients. Mm-hmm. And he didn't have a lab at first, so he's working out of his garage and in the backyard. Come into my garage and take yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you taking the piss? No, I'm keeping it. Eventually, he moved to an empty pantry in a new ward that was built just behind the hospital. I would have thought he would be yeah. doing it closer to the hospital, but anyway. Well, he was close. He's only 100 metres away from the hospital. Oh, anyway. Okay, all right. So there was an empty pantry, and so no one was using the ward. He moved <laughs> into the pantry. And everyone used to call this lab the shed because it's Australia. So to get, from the, to get from his house to the shed, it was a short stroll. He'd go through the back fence, past a chook pen, along a gravel path, boom, he's at his, at his that shed. Is, that is very Australian science. A, a thousand percent. But he needed one more thing before he could do his, his stuff properly, which was something to keep the wee-wee cold. So he started using the family fridge. No, yes. no, no. no. Yeah. no. It, 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 yeah. Well, there's yeah. a limited amount you can get in there. Well, I, th- I think it's pretty determined. And he had an old school post World War II mega frigid. Of course, that looked like you know a very cool plane. The one the that the one that the kids go inside, and there's a locking and mechanism that, yeah, d- yeah. that locks yeah. them all inside. Now, if you climbed in there, you deserve to stay. Yeah, we told you don't climb in the fridge. So he each patient's urine was decanted into screw top bottles and jars, numbered and shelved. <laughs> uh, every time anyone from the Cade family opened their frigid air door, <laughs> there would be a whole bunch of jars oh, of, of Dad! twinkle. Oh. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, oh, fuck me. How do you put uh, it? The stored jars of twinkle of several dozen mentally ill men would confront them. I don't know if it's better if it's your own or a family member. but Your own urine? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to process no. here. There's a little bit of me that says, no okay, if, 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 it's, if it's mine, at least I'm responsible. You know, I know where it came from. And, and if it's within the family, it's like, okay, that's, that's gross, but, you know, <laughs> like we can handle that. We know, we know the source material. But, yeah. like, a stranger's <laughs> urine is somehow worse for me. I don't, I, know. I, oh, I don't know. Maybe not knowing helps me. No, it doesn't help me. <laughs> I can imagine it's something else. <laughs> All right, so flip this around. Okay. So Desert Island. Yep. Uh, no, you're on it. You, you're on a Who's boat. Whose pee am I drinking first? Whose who's pee are you, drink, are you drinking? A stranger's, or are you drinking your own, or are you drinking a friend's, and you've monitored their diet. Mine first. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Who's second? Because I figure it's already been in me. It must be fine. Yeah. There you go. I know there are problems. All right. Are you drinking either. a family members, or are you drinking um, drinking a stranger's? Thank Christ, most of my family are dead. <laughs> 
I look by the time I'm um, screwed up enough to drink urine. I don't think I'd give a shit. Honestly, I may be wrong. What if we were in the in the boundary where you can still choose? Like I get, I get. You just want to say, <laughs> yeah, man, I drink your pee. <laughs> okay, brother, I'll, I'll drink your pee. I man. need to know, man. No, I'm not family, so you I know. can't go in. <laughs> But we, <laughs> this has a certain taste. This is a certain <laughs> Whose pee would you drink? Family, <laughs> podcast co-host, uh, stranger. This tastes oaty. <laughs> oh, I think mine would be acrid. <gasps> oh, jeez. Well, you can tell me later. But yeah, I don't, I don't want strangers' wee in my fridge. I don't want anyone's wee, but strangers <laughs> is worse. Well, apparently Gene and his two sons became quite used to it. So it was standard behaviour. You push aside a bottle or a couple of bottles of urine to get to the cheese. You can get used to anything, you can't can. you? Well, the quote from one of the sons was, to us it was all normal. We wouldn't have known whether everybody else did or didn't have urine in their fridges at home. You wouldn't have known, no. Yeah, they look, yeah. Why, why is your fridge so empty of the yellow jars? Mm. Like our fridge has heaps Where of them. Where do you keep your dad's piss? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, he's got heaps of piss now. He's got heaps of wee-wee. What now? I don't know. Do some science on it. Like, he, oh. shouldn't he have started doing science like straight away? Oh, in fact, no, he wanted to have enough. Why do you need to store it for ages before? Material. Why don't you get it from the gentleman or gentlewoman? Uh, take it to your lab. Yeah. Do the science on it, and then tip so it out. So he doesn't have a lab. He's got the pantry. He so he's just shed. storing at the moment. Well, you got to be ready. Uh, so he had no he had no equipment to analyze urine, and even if he did, he didn't know what he was looking for. So he did the obvious thing. Start looking for anything. Oh, no, even more obvious. He got a bunch of guinea pigs mm. from a nearby um, Mont Park Asylum. You, uh, you visited well, there too. We're talking these are real guinea pigs, yeah. Real actual guinea pigs, little creatures that the uh, South American countries eat. Mm. And he caged them up in his newly acquired lab, the pantry. And is he going to make them drink some... I'll get to that. So his son David still treasures the memory of walking into the pantry and seeing his father with all the guinea pigs. <laughs> Dad, you're covered in guinea pigs. What a great day. I love my childhood. His quote, uh, the guinea pigs were in cages, but we also had some at home. They got through a lot of kitchen scraps. I remember Dad hand, handing one of them on his left arm and stroking it. They were tame from constant handling. They were good looking. Sure. Tan, black, white. My favourite was a tan, a brown one. That's one of the sons. His wife, Jean, reminisces. We had guinea pigs in the shed. Lots of guinea pigs. As they died, we'd get some more. He was good to them. He'd call them darling. And he'd say... Why are you reading this in a weird voice? Well, you'll get to that. He'd call them darling. And he'd say, don't you mind me doing this as he injected them. With? So he would hold them on their backs carefully and inject the urine into their ab abdomens. No. Oh, yeah. No. Why are we... Why are we... Do, why, this isn't science. To help people. It's not science. Like, you don't seem well. I'm going to inject piss into this guinea pig. You'll be fine. <laughs> You gotta have a big correlation diagram. Too. Like, well, you very, know, very you know, it's it's like uh, patient Gary guinea pig uh, Chelsea, and then yep. Uh, yep. and then we put a bit of uh, Griselda into yep. Yep. Oh, into see. Keith. What coloured guinea pigs too? I mean, that, that's probably going to be important. <laughs> so you're not mixing. You're not you know you know put a, a couple of people into a little into bit a, of Bill, a little bit of Sadie. Why are we injecting it? You can make guinea pigs drink stuff. Well, he, that's gross. No, no, just being gross. So he was experimenting to see if the urine from manic patients might affect guinea pigs differently to urine from other patients. Okay, so so we've got some control guinea pigs and some control urine. Finally, there's some science. Yeah, okay. Still. This, this is from a maniac. This is from someone else. I'm going to put this one to this one, this one to that one. Let's see if they behave differently. And one by one, by one regardless of the diagnosis of the patients, the guinea pigs started dying. Well, yeah. Yeah. So he did post-mortems on every damn one. And as they died, he got more animals and he just kept on going. Is, is he thinking that maybe they don't need someone's urine in their... Whereabouts is it landing in their abdomen? I don't know, just abdomen. There's not a lot of it, but yeah, in the gatocular region. Yeah, not even a vein. So apparently um, he was also, a uh, quote from his biographer, uh, he was well aware that what he was doing was remarkably crude. So at first he kept quiet about his work, telling mm. only a few people mm. That's cool. who needed to know. So I'm doing some <laughs> I'm doing some secret shed science. Like seriously, what you doing in there? Oh, I'm in, it, look, it's, it, look, it's not like I'm injecting piddle into your guinea pig guts. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be crazy. I'm making a bomb. Okay, cool. Look, just as a warning sign, listener, if any member of your family is mm. uh, first of all storing urine in in their That's fridge, in your fridge, in your fridge, yeah. and then they're doing secret experiments in the shed that they can't tell anyone, it's not really science. And, and it's, there's a it's, mountain of dead guinea pigs out the back, <laughs> slowly accruing. Yeah, it's look, he's a science guy, but he was a bit 
edgy about this. No, so I think we can call he, him science guy later on because I'm assuming he does something successful. But I think right now, well, look, he's he's science adjacent. Like 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 a lot of science, sometimes you find things deliberately, and sometimes <laughs> you don't. Sometimes you're injecting we into the into guinea pigs, and then in in, in look in his defence, at least he didn't pretend. He, he at least pretended it was science because he could have just been doing it anyway. He's writing it. He's at least writing things down. Yeah, he's writing notes. Although later, uh, later on, it said his his notes might not have been too easy to replicate the experiments. <laughs> yeah. So early experiments suggested the urine from manic patients was more toxic than urine from other patients and killed more guinea pigs. Mm. But it turns out that wasn't really true. Okay. So the urine from a manic patient was no more no more likely to kill a guinea pig than any other sort of urine. So he started thinking, well, what if what? I did something different? No, no. What's in urine? Well, yes. What? Did we not know? Well, urine's probably too crass. Maybe he needed something more refined. Okay, yeah, okay. All right. Urine light. Urine extract of urine. What's he going to do here? So there's two toxic substances that were of interest, urea and uric acid. Not the same, both in urine. But they both start with ur. Yeah, or they all three. Urine, urea, uric acid. You're right. So they're both breakdown products. They're part of a body metabolisms, blah, blah, blah. And he was thinking maybe one of them is the chemical toxin he was looking for. So maybe there's more urea in manic urine just, than just, in just, normal Just to step ones, back a bit, though. He's gone, he's gone, okay, I've got mental patients. Yeah. And, uh, there's something causing and it. The, and, the, and there might be a chemical. Yeah, there might, there be, might a be a chemical. So I'll, I'll find a way to get some chemicals out of them. So piddle. And then I'll start analysing that. But he's latched on to the idea that in the piddle will be the, will be the chemical that is causing he's the problem. He's working with what he has. It's yeah, like I know. But a, it's desert island science. No, it, it does sound a little bit like he's stepped through to... He's, he's down in the weeds and he has, yeah. he's forgotten to look back at no. the... Hang on, what's the bigger picture here? Maybe, maybe if I compared some other things about, uh, you know... This is why you don't have a Nobel Prize. Does he have a Nobel Prize? No, oh. but you don't stick with it. <laughs> Uh, should he have? I don't know. He's, he's, he's not very alive anymore. So anyway, um, so he wanted to try and look into that. So he, he needed to, when he tested, uh, where were we up to? Blah, blah, blah. Urine, uh, maybe one of the chemicals was in that. More urea in manic urine than in urine of patients with other mental conditions. But when he tested the idea, he found manic urine had no more urea than any other urine. I'm gobsmacked. I'm gobsmacked. I, know, I, re- I really thought this would be the thing. It's troubling. They had too much, ur- they, their urine was too urine Yes, you have too like, much wee in your You've got weed. powerful urine. Too much piddle in your twinkle. So then he thought maybe uric, urea and uric acid might work in tandem to make the urine of manic. This is this more is the toxic. most classic. You know that you know the it's I think it's an Irish proverb. You know why was the why the was, more you know the less the better. Uh, why was the drunk man looking for looking for his keys under the under the light post? And he said, "Well, I can't see anywhere else. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where else would I look?" <laughs> so he thought. Uh, if they're working in tandem, I've got to. This is where it starts to get interesting. So. He wanted to make up different strengths of uric acid that he could convert into a substance that he could more easily manipulate. All right. But on its own, uric acid doesn't dissolve in water. So he added lithium to it, <laughs> which gave him lithium look, urate. Look, obviously, listener, you know the end, of the end as well. L- like, <laughs> like, Jesus, what a lucky fucker. Like, he just I took, know. at one moment in his life, he took, well, why don't I randomly add the thing that's going to help? <laughs> What a Jesus Christ! I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I told you it was about Seriously, lithium eventually. I'm going to play around in someone's poo, basically. Okay, uh, it's not their poo, but not far off. I'm just going to play in the paddling pool of and poo. And it stinks a bit, so I'm going to uh, put some rose water under my nose. And rose then, water's uh, the magic. <laughs> well, it's like he, he accidentally in, interjected antibiotics into yeah. into the poo, and it's yeah. like. Jesus yeah. Christ. And he was using it as a catalyst. Oh, my God. I, like, yeah. Look, I, I yeah. will, in his defense, I'm assuming he documented this enough to then go, I have made a discovery. De- and that's, de- and that's a legitimate enough. discovery. Definitely but Jesus, enough. what a playing around in your poo way to do, make a discovery. Oh, there's a few more steps. <laughs> they weren't perfect. Um, so he added lithium. That gave him lithium urate. And, of course, because he was adding new stuff, he's a scientist, he had to check if lithium was causing any confounds. So he didn't. He put it in a guinea pig. Yeah, he put lithium alone in and lithium carbonate solutions into the guinea pigs as well as lithium urine. And they all died again. No, so he put it in the pigs, the guinea pigs, and they become more docile. Okay. And he said in one description, he simply lifted one guinea pig, one of the guinea pigs. He turned it over, placed it gently on its back after he'd injected it, and instead of fighting to stand up and basically get out of this entirely vulnerable position, it just kind of went. That's cool. It's just blissing out. Just lay there. Yeah. All right. And he did it again and again. He got the same results. 
So his quote was, they would lie on their backs, staring with soft eyes, while he gently prodded them with a stub of the index finger. He'd never seen them behave like this before. They seemed alert, but they were calm. <laughs> Hang on, does is he missing like a chunk of his index finger? No, this is described as stub. I assume they just mean. I was just kind of visualizing yeah. him as a. Dude oh yeah, he only had one hand as well. <laughs> and a, he had a <laughs> limp, and he spoke like a pirate. <laughs> Didn't I mention that? <laughs> you should have done. I thought some. Crazy, crazy shit happened during the war, and he's, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. he's just got stub fingers to do his science work. Most, most people Listener, if you have stub that. fingers, that's awesome. I'm, I'm celebrating stub fingers. I just like to visualize this. You're celebrating stub fingers. I am. Not that I do it myself. I'm just saying. God, you're a diverse person. I'm just saying that he's, <laughs> if he's prodding with just the one knuckle of his finger, and he's doing all his science with yeah, one knuckle. Yeah. Look, if that is the case, it didn't come up, which you'd think it would. It, it should. So the next step to him was obvious, um, and the quote from his biographer, because he was a man of great honour and he was very religious, he felt he couldn't inflict a new you substance. No, that's what I always patient. think. As, yeah. as, as a, a, a dude who routinely in, injects religious. urine into guinea pigs, yeah. a man of great honour. Yeah. Like he's basically a fucking Galahad right here. Yep. He's, he's yep. the knight of the round table yep. Yep. of injecting urine Unless into guinea pigs. Unless you're a guinea pig. <laughs> Every other creature of God's green earth loves He's committing him. a genocide of guinea pigs yeah. via urine somehow. Yeah. Yes, honour. Honour. Yeah. Man of great honour. So he was worried that he couldn't do this to humans, so he started swallowing lithium himself first. Did he? For a few weeks. Okay, and so he wants to check if it's, if it's got negative he's, side effects. He's going to fuck people up. So the quote is, and he didn't die, he didn't curl up in a ball in the corner, and he didn't have fits, so he decided it was okay to give to patients. And he knew who his first patient would be. Oh, really? Yeah. Bill Brand, he's, obviously. He's got some sort of guinea pig-looking patient. <laughs> got- Multicoloured skin, quite furry. Uh, Bill Brand, he was a psychotic who'd be, uh, for more than 30 years. He was a patient at the asylum in Bandura for most of the 30 years mm-hmm. that they knew him. He used to rummage around in rubbish bins at the asylum. He was manic. He'd try to spend all the money he had. He'd abscond if he got anything. So he was, he was a flight risk. Um, his life was the quintessential life of a seriously mentally ill patient. He'd cut off the tips of two fingers while working as a labourer. Stubs? Yep. Not Cade, though. He was disowned and alien, alienated from his family, and he'd just been left in the asylum because okay. they didn't know what to do with him. So the guy was... Fucking sick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was not a well guy. So in March of 48, 1948, Cade put Brand on some lithium. He didn't He didn't put it in some urine first and then and inject into it. His gut. Yeah, guinea pig urine, though, to bounce it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I love the quote again from the biographer. A man with a strong moral compass, Cade felt this was the ethical thing to do. What? To give this guy lithium. Because the guy was almost certainly going to die a miserable death alone, there was nothing much to lose because he was already having a shit Oh, yeah, life. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. It's fucked anyway. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So let's just fuck him faster, maybe. There were no ethics committees back then, so he was only answerable to his own conscience. Oh, look, and I don't... Uh, there are still... I mean, I don't know how much... Uh, you're not allowed to talk about it, your ethics committee, but... Uh, I'll talk about it. But no, there, there are, there are they certainly... They don't listen to this. No, there are certainly uh, situations in society where someone is sectioned and they can have uh, medicine yeah. given to them without their consent because they're not able to give some sort of consent. And yeah, supposedly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 What, what are you going to do? He, was, what are you he, gonna do? He, he couldn't say no. I got, I got a barrel of guinea pig urine here. What am I going to do with it? Yeah, it's it's got to get nitrates. somewhere. Yeah. Might as well give it to this guy. So he made a, a liquid lithium solution, and over over three weeks, as he fed it to him, Brand started to get better. So his speech stopped being manic. He stopped rummaging in the bins. <laughs> I know. <laughs> look, look, that might have been an okay part of his personality. Like, I get the speech yeah, not being manic. Yeah, we have a colleague who, you know, who likes that. <laughs> look, everyone likes, everyone loves a bit of uh, bin dive occasionally. You, look you find some stuff. <laughs> you find some good stuff. There's some the, lovely filth back down in, here. Back in the old days when you could go to the dump and actually walk around through the dump and, you know, find some good stuff. Oh, not anymore because it kills everyone. If you rummage in the dump and take things, everyone dies. Yeah, well, no, it's the giant compacting crushing machines that I worry about. But uh, oh, you, you got to go to an old school tip face then. Yeah, yeah, not yeah. Not a transfer station. Yeah, well, I grew up in a small town where, oh. you know, we just, we just had a big f- pile. Yeah, we had old school tip face. Yeah. And my parents were fancy. They wouldn't let us get out and look look for cool stuff. Really? They wouldn't let us. I never brought anything back. I like looking for stuff, though. I like thinking that, thinking there might be some treasure. And I'd, I'd go for a look. I would have hoarded like a maniac. <laughs> I would have brought back the <laughs> No, I've got, I've got intense tactile defensive. I couldn't bring anything back. Like, it'd have to be literally pirate treasure for me to go, okay, this and, is... And, this, this. and put in autoclave before you got <laughs> in the car. <laughs> but it was good fun looking. I loved it. That was great. Yeah, there's so many things. 
So apparently after about two months, Brand, our, our buddy from the, yeah, the psychotic, yeah. walked out of the asylum, back to his old job, perfectly sane. Two months, wow. Two months. Um, and they said, look, basically nothing like this had been seen. And in they his old before. job was the rummaging through the bins? Or oh, no, no, there no. was a labourer was... where he'd lost a couple of oh, fingers. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, there's always a but. Uh, as as the, the psychiatrist who wrote this biography said, um, in many ways, Bill's story is archetypal of many mental health sufferers. So he returns to his old job because he's well. And because he's well, he decides... And he's well forever now. He's, well, he's that's it. He said, well, I'm well now. I don't need the medication. Oh. This happens a lot. Um, so he gets sick again, gets yeah. bipolar again, gets goes back to hospital. So when he gets back, Cade goes, well, fuck me, lithium worked. Let's give him more and more and more to get him back to normal. Yes. But too much lithium is toxic. Ah, uh, Okay. And so in the late 40s, they didn't know what the correct dose would be because sure, it's experimental. Okay. Sure, sure. So Brand got lithium toxic basically and died in 1950. Oh, all right. Yeah, which really fucked Cade up. So Cade was really freaked and he went, I, I, don't, I don't like this anymore. And he wasn't sure about whether it was. It was, was a pretty big hint though it's that hint. Um, something yeah. went right. And I get that, yeah. uh, that Brand was having a bad life and, and mm. it ended badly, no mm. doubt. But um, It ended badly. And it, it says, look, so in parallel with Brand, or maybe Brand was the first, Kate, I'm not sure, it wasn't clear, but Kate had treated 10 people with mania and he wrote this up. He actually did publish something. There you go. So in late 1940, Journeys into guinea pig wee. Yeah. Et cetera, and then right, very right, right down the Fridge piddle I've kept. Yeah. Diary of a Madman. Oh, no, that's an Ozzy Osbourne album. Great album, by the way, great album. Different podcast. In September, he... he he reported these dramatic improvements and he put it in the Medical Journal of Australia. Oh, there you go. September, sorry, 1949. The majority of the patients had been in and out of Bandura for a number of years, but now five had improved enough to return home to their families. So that was good, five out of ten, which mm -hmm. is better than none. Okay. Um, the I, yep, the, I'm not going to quibble. They didn't quibble? Well, you know, half quibble. of them. And also they'd been in and out already. Yeah. So like... Yeah. The, and. Look so five your, of them your, continued with the in and out. You and your facts and your knowledge and your actual observations of reality. True, though. But, yeah, five, five out of ten is better than none out of ten, and none out of ten was more common. Okay. So 50% improved, which is it's great. Um, but the paper went largely unnoticed, and in 1950 he abandoned lithium experiments. Oh, did he really? Yeah, he just went, oh, fuck it. It's too dangerous. I killed a dude. I don't like it. No one, okay, no, no one like my paper. No, no, I get the I, get the, yeah. I killed a dude. And yeah. no one gave a shit about my paper, so whatever. But he so he started experimenting with salts of rubidium, cerium, strontium, uranium. Strontium is radioactive. Yeah, rather, but none of them apparently proved to be therapeutic. Uh. And I love. I'll, I'll get to the end in a moment. But as an aside, Kate, much later in his life, he said he realized that the guinea pigs were probably becoming calm because it was a, a, a side effect of toxic. Amounts of lithium, anyway, is this passive lying around? So uh, yeah, okay. even, even then, it was likely that maybe the reason it seemed to be working, yeah, okay, was oops as well. <laughs> it's all so much oops. So anyway, um, in the 1960s, his discovery was actually heralded as something really good. How'd this happen? Uh, well, look, it, I'll, 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 I'll wander into it. So I'll, I'll get to the where lithium is today to close this out, but um. So apparently people were very stoked by the 60s, and, but he was apparently very humble. He, he is dead. Um, so he wrote, he did this amazing thing, but he was very quiet about it, say his biographers. He wrote a book on the history of psychiatry after he retired. There was a chapter on lithium, and he didn't mention that he was the individual who discovered the miracle of lithium and how it could help people with bipolar. That is weird. It is weird. That's weird. Yeah. It's like... Uh Maybe maybe he was still like uh, look, I kind of did all right. Maybe he's feeling a bit guilty, but yeah. don't don't write the chapter if you're feeling a bit guilty. Or maybe I was lucky, and it was a history of psychiatry, so he's just like, look, it that works. That is now. so weird. Yeah, he didn't do it. Well, allegedly, again, he was a, a humble guy. So he died in 1980, November 1980, mm. and there are heaps of honors. Like so, there, there's a uh, psychiatric areas uh, around the hospitals in Australia are named after him. There's a National Health and Medical Research Council couple of grants called the. Um, NHMRC John Cade Fellowship in Mental Health Research. Oh, cool. 750 grand a year for uh, two of them. Uh, the Guinea Pig Society? Yes, the Guinea Pig Society. And the Urine, Urine Appreciation Society? What no, did they say? They got a photo of him. It's like the Rotary Club and the picture of the Queen. That's what they're like. <laughs> Urine Keepers Anonymous? Yeah. So he's got a lot of awards. Faculty of Medicine at the University of Melbourne award the John Cade Memorial Prize. Like So a bunch of this stuff went on. So he's, he's well acknowledged, he's well liked um, and well considered. So what about lithium? Where are we at? Yeah. Where, where's lithium end up? So an Australian source, obviously, called lithium the, quote, penicillin story of mental health. 
And I can see that because yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. accidental oopsie poos, let's keep trying, holy shit, something worked. Mm, mm. Which penicillin I'm summarizing, but it was pretty much of of a similar type. Like yeah. that. Collecting a whole bunch of urine and then you And you forget to wash your dishes, boom, and I've, then I've suddenly, cured yeah. things. Um, but another source says we need to acknowledge the Danish psychiatrist Mogens Schau, who also fought long and hard to get lithium accepted as a treatment for bipolar disorder since the early fifties. So he kind of took it up. He and a buddy actually ran real well, experiments. Someone, I thought someone would have to take it up yeah. at this point. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, given it kept going. So, yeah, he and a buddy found it. They got into it. They did double blind placebo controlled clinical trials. Oh, they did actual science. Yeah, they did real hardcore science. And did they do like a little bit of guinea pig injecting on the side just, just to just to keep the tradition? <laughs> like, like, and also, also multi methods. You know, we did some proper science and some guinea pigs. Just, just in case there's something Cade missed, because maybe we can help animals too. Um, so in, the 19, in 1970, in The Lancet, they published a paper that established beyond doubt that lithium was effective for most people with bipolar. That's so it wild. took to 1970. Yeah. And so basically, people who Lord uh, Cade is the only guy say, look, we've got we've to be aware of these other two dudes as well, at least. Okay, fair enough. So that's fair. Um, so thanks to them all. It's easy to manufacture it. The, the element was never patented by pharmaceutical companies, so it's cheap and available. Oh, you can't patent an element. No, you can't. That would be rude. Well, I don't think you can. I mean, no. I mean God maybe. Um, God already holds the Or the, the nature man. of the universe. God, God holds all the Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But God, God's like a, a Creative Commons sort of guy. <laughs> I think he is. Like, I reckon you're right. I just do, nearly, do what you like. Do I nearly like. spat my delicious Bruni Island waste out all over oh, the yeah. microphone. Um, so lithium, of course, isn't perfect. There are side effects. What? It's not perfect? I actually how could this be? I actually years ago worked in an area where I, I was interviewing a bunch of people who, for research purposes, who were very suffering greatly from bipolar and 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 deep depression. Yep. And the ones who were on lithium, the side effects, particularly, it was horrible to see. Uh, the women were very large, and oh, okay. uh, a lot of them had thinning hair, uh, which is yeah. some of the side effects. Like you do, it's it's non-zero. some people pay, yeah, yeah. But you also get you know like hand tremors, frequent urination, thirst, stuff like that. That's not common. <laughs> It can cause irregular heartbeat. How, how frequent are we talking? Because you know, the there's, there's, there's times and days where I'm like, I feel like I, I get that like side that. effect anyway. Yeah. Well, stop taking so much lithium. <clears throat> yeah, there are, there are a lot of potential side effects. Kidney disease can happen. You can get too much calcium in the blood. Blah, 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 blah. Mm. So if it doesn't work for you, it can be a problem. But if it does work for you, it's quite, mm, mm, like, mm. it's life-changing. So today, there was a piece in Nature in 2019 that said lithium helps to stabilize the moods of millions of people with bipolar disorder today. But you have to be careful because of the side effects. So you've got to be very dose aware. And its mechanisms are still a mystery. That's the thing. Yeah. I love that. It's that's, classic that's psychiatry. We, it works, but we have no but, idea But why. even more than classic psychiatry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's super, super simple as an element. Like it's, it's yep. as simple yep. as you can get. There ain't well, nothing to it. Close enough. It's like there's only two elements simpler. And and then yep. it works. That is so weird. Like every other yep. chemical that yep. that we have that we take, you know, you look at those chemical diagrams. They're huge and they interact weirdly yeah. with the cells and and with yep. molecules. Yep. This thing's tiny. This one's like it's a really dumb, simple thing, and we put it in there, yeah, and it seems to mostly work. So, so we don't even know. No, they speculate. Oh, you know, something to do with the functioning of neurotransmitters. Blah blah blah. But like, blah, blah, blah. and um, here, here's my favorite, which kind of brings us back to the natural spas, etc. So in July of last year, 2020, uh, there was a study published in the British Journal of Psychiatry that talked about how uh, public drinking water with trace levels of naturally occurring lithium seems to have anti-suicidal effects on the population who consume it. Yeah. So there was a systematic review, a meta-analysis of a whole bunch of studies from Austria, Greece, Canberra, Italy. Canberra, Canberra. Uh, Canberra. No, Lithuania, UK, Japan, US, a lot of countries. Yeah, okay. And it correlated, correlated, uh, naturally occurring lithium levels in drinking water samples and suicide rates in 1,286 regions or counties in these areas. See, that's a lot. Once you that's get a correlation a that big, uh, you know, you yeah, can... Yeah, it's a lot. And, and it shows clear um, a clear situation where the, the suicide levels are lower in those with these... Should we put lithium in the drinking water? So, But there's not a lot. It's far below clinical levels of lithium. Yeah, sure. So hints. Yeah, well, should we put a hint? Yes, with the fluoride. Wave some lithium... Lithium around. fluoride. There you go. That's what we need in our water. So yeah, that's what we're looking at with lithium. It's um, it's it definitely does stuff. I think it's so weird though, like like that it is such a simple, like an atom. Mm. It's an atom, not not even a molecule, not mm. even this complicated thing, and yep. yet it does something. Yep. 
I get why he's humble though. Because he's embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> look, look deep down. Uh, it is. It is a little bit like the 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 penicillin story. I get. You yeah, know, it's yeah. a bit. Um, it's like, uh, yeah. Look, it was. I was doing some dumb science. Uh, uh, not dumb, but no, dumb. Creative. Dumb, <laughs> dumb science, and I stumbled across something that well, is actually awesome. I love it as, a, cut, awesome. it as a cutting agent. It's like you know, you don't talk about the gin. You talk about the uh, tonic water. Oh yeah. It turned like, out to be the tonic, not the gin, that was making the difference. Uh, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> Look, and awesome to contribute to the world by falling ass over backwards into discovering something that helps so many people. Absolutely. But, uh, <sighs> there you go. Awesome. Thank you, Nirvana. Who I, who I met? Did I tell you that? I, I did I hear met. that you met. Yeah, Nirvana. Are you going to tell the story of that, or is that in your other podcast? That's another time. Oh my god! You should tell the story in your other podcast. It's called The Forge. One day it will be released. Oh my god! Wait, you just put it out. The wholesome show. It's this podcast. It's me, Will Grant, and him, Rod Lambert. So this weird thing with his name. He says a super long name at the beginning of the podcast. And then nothing. And at the end, he's like, no, you've heard my name. You can't hear it again you know to reinforce. Sh- you know how shy I am. <laughs> to reinforce my name. <laughs> so The Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science. Guinea pigs. We're back next week, listener. Listener.